Aloha. My people, I am back in the second part of these three levels of understanding. I didn't want to keep the first one too long. I want to keep them both the same. And there was like nine parts of this. Ten parts of this. So I wanted to had to do it in two or just be way, way too long. So I'll link it. The first one, if you're coming to this one, or I'll link these together. It's kind of just give a little playlist on this, and I think that's much easier. Welcome to my channel. I'm I'm Jax. This is unapologetically Jax. If you're tuning into this video, and uh, there is a part before this, um, talking about uh, three levels of understanding in our walk with the Lord, as babes in Christ, and then and as youths, and then as mature believers. So I'm going to continue on. My last video, I left off. Uh, part five, which was called maturity. Now I'm on to part six, and I'm reading from Rick Longva's Daily Thoughts from Scripture. He's got some great stuff in here, and I will find out if he's printing these, because people have asked. I promise I will do it today when I'm done this video. Please remind me, Lord. Okay, so three levels of understanding, part six. Necessary steps to maturity. As was said yesterday, or in the last video, this is a devotional. There are many steps that are taken to bring us to maturity. Scripture study is only one of them. Communication with other believers is another. Prayer and meditation with the Lord is another. Helping those who are in need, who need help, is also another. Going through trials would also be another. Times of suffering is also a step to maturity. Success and failure help bring us to maturity. And there are probably many more steps that are necessary to bring us to maturity in the Lord. Apologize for any sound. I got all these huge construction trucks going by. There's construction down the road. God will see to it that all these necessary steps bring us to maturity in Him. He will not only give us one or two of these necessary steps, all of them will come to us on our steps to maturity. The religious world is filled with teachers telling their congregations that they are suffering they don't have God's favor. No kidding. If they have lost all their earthly possessions, they don't have God's favor. If they're going through countless trials or just can't seem to make ends meet, they are without God's favor. The truth is, all these trials and sufferings, good times and bad times, reveal to us we are more than favored. We are being groomed into a mature person the son da or daughter of God. No one can compete, complete, sorry. No one can be complete unless they have undergone trials and sufferings, hardships, losses, as well as good times and prosperity. James says, all joy deem it, my brethren, whenever you should be falling into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith is producing endurance. Now let endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and unimpaired lacking in nothing, James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. To be lacking in nothing is to have all you need. With that knowledge you mature, you become focused on things above where Christ is. And Christ sits, not on this so-called God's favor that causes you to look at whatever you have or don't have, turning you into a child who only wants what he or she sees, not what you are. A believer who God loves and is using every experience in your life and every step you take as necessary to bring you to maturity in Him. Part 7. Maturity's Goal Paul tells us we are Christ's achievement, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And our lives are hidden in Him, Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. So it stands to reason that He is the one bringing us into maturity, using what would seem to be the most insignificant moments in our lives as well as the most dramatic moments in our, in our lives, is an ongoing process until we reach our full stature. I don't know what the heck that was. It was a fly or a bee. It didn't sound like a bee. We read in Ephesians what that full stature is. Unto the end that we should all attain to the unity of the faith and of the realization of the Son of God, to a mature man to the measure of the stature of the accomplishment of the Christ, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. When full maturity comes, we shall be like him. Contrary to pop popular theology, we are not going to be sub-members of his body. 
We are going to be co-laborers with him. This can only be true because he said, he is, set, he, he is said to dwell in us, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. And we are hidden in him, Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 3. We are to have this mindset. For let this disposition be in you, which is in Christ Jesus also, who being infer- inherently in the form of God, does not deem it pillaging to be equal with God, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. We will be equal in purpose, as Christ is equal in purpose with his Father. We are not robbing Christ of his glory. We will be the fulfillment of his glory. We will recognize all there is in Christ, as Paul tells us, yet then I shall recognize according as I am recognized also. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 12. As Christ now knows us, we, we will know him. We will be, as Paul says in Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 17, enjoyers also of an allotment, enjoyers indeed of an allotment from God, yet joint enjoyers of Christ's allotment. If so, be that we are suffering together, that we should be glorified together also. This is the goal of maturity in Christ. We will have the stature of Christ, be equal with him, know him as he knows us, and be joint enjoyers of his allotment. All the steps we will take to maturity are ordered by him, and all of them will lead us into the full maturity in Christ. Yay. Part 8. Maturity doesn't save anyone. Some teach, and I assume believe, that we are saved by knowledge. That being, the more you know about God, the closer to God you'll be. The less you know about God, the further away from God you will be. We are not saved by knowledge, or works, or because we are good people, or are deserving of, in any way of his salvation. We are saved by grace. Period. What we know about God, or what we do not know, has no bearing on our salvation. But when we begin to understand just what grace is, and what Christ has done, we will enter into his peace, and put off the practices of the world, as well as religion. Some will remain immature their whole walk with God. Paul tells us, who are maturing the Lord to, the infirm in the faith, be taking to yourselves, but not for discrimination of reasonings, Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Never are immature believers to be seen as weak in Christ's body. We are all part of the body of Christ, known by God. All in the Lord have knowledge. We are aware that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, yet love builds up. If anyone is presuming to know anything, he knew not as yet according as he must know. Now if anyone is loving God, this one is known by him, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to through 3. Sorry. Oh, okay, there's people behind me. I wasn't sure if someone was like walking up behind me because <laughs> I wasn't looking. This knowledge in the Lord is of no value if there is no lo- if there is no love. Those who seem to be weakest and most ignorant of the things of God can be the most loving of all believers, and the ones with all knowledge can be the most hardest of believers. Neither is above the other in Christ, yet only one is practicing the great greatest precept of God, love. John chapter 13 verse 34 to 15 I think it's 34 to 35 it said 34 to 15 it's 34 to 35 because that doesn't make sense otherwise so although knowledge of the things of God is very good and endeavoring to present ourselves approved of God a worker cutly correcting the word of truth is of much benefit in knowing God and brings us into maturity of the things of God love is superior love is superior to all as as love reveals God in us, from the most immature believer to the mature believer, because without love, we won't know God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Part 9. All parts are necessary. Just as all parts of our body have a part in our daily lives, so do all members of Christ's body in our journey to maturity. If someone feels inferior or superior in their place in Christ's body, it is not the Lord who would put that thought in their minds. Paul tells us, For even as the body is one and has many members, yet all the members of the one body, being many, are one body, thus also is the Christ. For in one spirit also we are all baptized into one body. Hang on a second. I'm 
parched here. I've been reading for like 25 minutes. Where'd I leave off? Oops. Uh, okay. For one spirit, also, we are all baptized in one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and, are, and all are made to imbibe one spirit. For the body also is not one member, but many. If the foot should be saying, seeing that I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Not far, not for this is it not of the body. And if the ear should be saying, seeing that I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Nor for this is it not of the, the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where's the scent? Yet now God placed the members, each one of them, in the body according as he wills. Now if it were all one member, where, where were the body? Question mark. Yet now there are indeed many members, yet one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, 12 to 20. Sorry, people. I've been reading without my reading glasses. This is my second video. It's really bothering my eyes, and I should have known better. I didn't think I was going to read all this, but... We're all parts of the, the body of Christ. From the seemingly most immature, quote unquote, weakest, or brackets weakest, to the seemingly most mature, all have their function in his body. None is over the other or better than the other. All are for the upbuilding of one another. Again, Paul makes this clear from Ephesians chapter four, verse 15 and 16. Now being true, in love, we should be making all grow into him who is the head, Christ, out of whom the entire body, being articulated together and united through every assimilation of the, the supply, in accord with the operation and measure of each one's part, is making for the growth of the body, for the upbuilding of itself in love. Each part of his body, us, has a part in each other's part for the growth of his body, us. No one should ever be made to feel inferior. No one should ever be put on a pedestal. Christ would not place any one of us in a higher or lower position in his body. There are places of higher responsibility in the future reign, but in his body we are all one and are all necessary for our growth. Part 10, this very last part. I'm making good time, so it's perfect. The Master Grower. As was said yesterday, or in the last video, first part one, this. We are all necessary to one another for our growth in the body of Christ. Paul says, I plant, Apollos irrigates, but God makes it grow up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6. Paul then goes on to say, so that neither is he who is planting anything, nor he who is irrigating, but God who makes it grow up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 7. We all have our parts, but it is God and only God that makes us grow. Not the teachers, not the pastors, not the evangelists, only God. God is the one who places these others from Christ's body in our lives to cultivate our hearts and minds. Paul calls us God's farm, God's building, and we are God's fellow workers, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. And he is the master grower and builder. Paul says that we are fellow citizens of the saints and belong to God's family, being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the capstone of the corner being Christ Jesus himself, in whom the entire building being connected together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling place in spirit. Ephesians chapter two, verse 19 and 22. We all will reach maturity in God, some sooner than later, because we're all God's dwelling place. We will all do our part for each other as God places all of us in Christ's body for this one purpose, to be presenting every human mature in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. The master grower will not fail in harvesting what he has planted. And that's the end of that series. I feel like I'm going to go cross-eyed. <laughs> oh, because that's what I get for not bringing my glasses. And my leg's gone asleep, and I think my, half my butt's asleep. Thank you also for watching. I don't want to do too much yip yapping. The first video was about 17 minutes long. This one's almost 15. I've got ants crawling on me. I think I got. I think I got a bug in my hair. I love you all so very much. I greet you all with a holy kiss. 
thank you so much for watching. If you're new to my channel, give me a, you know, give it a like. It always helps the algorithms. I hate saying that, but you know what? It's true. And uh, sub if you want, or don't. But you know, I always love comments too. So this will be like a little mini series. Next time I decide to do this, okay, well, I didn't even know what I was doing. So I, I got here and I asked what I was gonna read. Right over there is my car and my purse. And my glasses are in my purse, I think. Or I took them out and forgot them my home. I don't know. I'll find out after. I love you all so much. Hope you're having a wonderful, blessed day wherever you are, day and night. And I'll talk to you again soon. Next time with my reading glasses. This is getting silly. I've been doing this the last few videos. And I know better. Well, you'd think so. In four days, I'm going to be 54 years old. You'd think that I would know better to just bring my darn glasses. I knew I was going to make a video. Well, I had an idea. I have my bag of tricks in the car. I call it my bag of tricks, my scriptures, daily thoughts. I've got Martin Sender's uh, Flaw by Design and uh, First Day in Heaven. I've got my scriptures, the Concord Literal, Paul's Epistles. I've got, you know, the daily thoughts from scripture. And, you know, and some of those aren't um, what, it, what Rick Longva uses um, are from like John and James and Hebrews. But we, we know those who don't know, I'm just telling you right now, I won't make this too long. But there are scriptures throughout the entire scriptures that are trans-administrational. There are some things that are absolutely for the uncircumcision, evangel, the apostle Paul, us. And then there's those that are for the circumcision, the 12, Peter, James and crew. And I don't want to name them all. Anyhow, and then there's things that in the Old Testament and the New that are trans-administrational, meaning they have practical application in line with our lives and our, and our spiritual lives. And also in our lives. Proverbs is like a book of wisdom. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.